Testing, testing, can everybody hear me? All right, so this is just a heads up for our uh, AV team back there. So sometimes I may click the button and it'll black out the screen, but that's me, just to let you know. Okay. You know, it is, it is literally, uh, well, first off, before I even get into that, I just want to really thank the Lord for the privilege of being able to come here, uh, myself and my wife. Uh, we have been uh, looking in uh, anticipation uh, for this time for a little while now, and we are praying that by the grace of God, this series can be a blessing for each and every one of us. And, you know, even as it pertains to these technical div uh, difficulties, it is literally without fail, almost every place that we go, there's always something wrong with the technology. I remember we were in uh, San Antonio a couple months ago, and uh, during uh, the church service on Sabbath, literally as we were about to start preaching, all of the technology and the lights literally just shut off. And it came back on in, in about 15 minutes, but the gentleman uh, who we were working with, he said that that never happens at this church. This never happens. And so in light of these things happening, uh, to us, we just interpret it of the fact that Satan is scared and afraid of what God wants to do with each and every one of us individually. Now, who here is thankful to be here this evening? Amen. You know, because the reason why each and every one of us here are here is because we really believe that Jesus is about to come back the second time. Now, we would not be in this sanctuary today, literally coming on a Sunday where everyone is doing so many other things, we would not be in this church unless we actually believed that Jesus was about to come back. Now, does anybody know what is the subject matter for this week of prayer? Anybody know? Anybody know? I'll say it again. Yes, revival, but there is a specific title for this week. Does anybody know it? It's entitled Written for Our Learning. Written for Our Learning. Now, do you think that there are lessons from the past that we need to understand? There are serious lessons from the past that we need to understand. Now, in light of that, I'm going to have a word of prayer that by God's grace, his Holy Spirit will be with us because in order for us to really receive what God wants to give to us, the Holy Spirit has to abide with us. And this is something that we really emphasize when we go from place to place. It doesn't matter how many doctrines are taught. It doesn't matter how much of the truth is communicated. If the Holy Spirit is not present to impress these things upon our conscience, our lives are not going to be changed. And so in light of that, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and by the grace of God, we will begin. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to be able to come together as a church family, to, to study the sacred teachings of your holy word, I pray that you would please forgive us of our sins. I pray that you would cleanse us from unrighteousness. Lord, I pray that you'd be with all of my brothers and sisters that are here. I pray that you'd be with every family that is represented. I pray that you'd be with those who are possibly wavering in the valley of decision as to whether or not they should come. I pray that they will come out. And I pray, dear Lord, that you would please be with my mind. I pray that you would uh, soften my intellect, that you would bring back to my remembrance everything that you have communicated to me, that nothing will be lost through any of my defective utterance. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now let's open up our Bibles. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Romans. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Romans. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, and we're going to see what the Bible says in Romans chapter 15. Now, does everybody have their Bible, their actual physical Bible? Yes. Now, why do you think it's important to have a physical Bible and not merely have it on your cell phone? Does anybody know why it is really important to actually have a physical Bible? 
It's simply because it helps with the retaining of the information that God is communicating. Does that make sense? All right. Now, does everybody see what this is? Now, just by looking at this picture, who do you think that this is an artist's rendition of? Yes, this is an artist's rendition of Moses. Now, was Moses a mighty man of the Lord? Yes, he was. Moses was a mighty man of the Lord. Now, Romans chapter 15, Romans chapter 15, and we're going to read in verse 4. Notice what the Bible says. It says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our what? For our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have despair. Is that what it says? That we may have hope. So the purpose of why God is communicating this is ultimately that we may have what? Now, what is the blessed hope that the Bible communicates in Colossians chapter 1? Verse 27, what is the hope of glory according to the Bible? Yes, Christ in us, the hope of glory. So the Bible is saying that these things that happened in the past is to inspire the implantation of the Holy Spirit within us. Does that make sense? Now notice what the prophet says. Now this is taken from volume three of the testimonies. Now, who here, by show of hands, has ever heard of the nine volumes of the testimonies? And this is something that we are going to continually emphasize, is that especially as seven-day Adventists, certainly there could be given a, a pardon for those of us who may not be seven-day Adventists, but especially for those of us who are seven-day Adventists, we need to start reading and studying the spirit of prophecy. Unfortunately, again, we live in a day and age that especially in our church, the writings of the testimonies are overtly attacked. Now, why do you think they're attacked? Yes, because it's truth. Because is it the testimony of Ellen G. White or is it the testimony of Christ? It's the testimony of Christ. Now, notice what inspiration says. This says the Apostle Paul plainly states that the experience of the Israelites in their travels has been recorded for the benefit of those living in this age of the world. So do you think we need to understand the experience of ancient Israel? Yes. Those upon whom the ends of the world are come, we do not consider that our dangers are any less than those of the Hebrews, but what? So you mean to tell me that what ancient Israel went through is actually not in comparison to what we're going through in this generation. Now, in, in these days of the ancient Hebrews, did they have to deal with Instagram and TikTok? Did they have to deal with Pornhub and all of these other things, these mediums that Satan is using to distract our conscience? No, they didn't. This says, there will be temptations to jealousies and murmurings, and there will be outspoken rebellion as are recorded of ancient Israel. There will ever be a spirit to rise up against the reproof of sins and wrongs, but shall the voice of reproof be hushed because of this? Now, this is a question. Why do you think we as human beings, why do you think we do not like to be reproved? Why do you think we don't like to be told that we're doing the wrong thing and that we need to turn away from things that we are practicing that are wrong? Why do you think we do not like being told what to do? You know, the book Desire of Ages, it says simply because we want to manage ourselves. Our biggest problem is that we want to live our life the way we want to live it, and we don't want anyone to tell us what to do. Now notice this. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Proverbs. We have an entire week, and by the grace of God, I'm going to really seek not to rush through this. Because I'm telling you, family, we have a lot to get through this week. And I have been really praying that by the grace of God, the Lord will really unlock our understanding. 
So we're going to turn to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. And we're going to start in verse 23. Now notice what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 6 in verse 23. It says, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of what? The way of life. So the Bible is saying is that if we want to have life, we have to be willing to be what? Reproved. Now notice why. In verse 24, it says, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange what? And the temptation may not be women, it may be money, it may be lying, stealing, cheating, whatever the case may be. And so it goes on to reference a number of different things later on in this, in this text. But notice what this goes on to finish saying. If so, we shall be in no better situation than are the various denominations in our land who are afraid to touch the errors and prevailing sins of the people. Now, does anybody know what is the specific title of our message for this evening? Does anybody know? I'll say it again. Yes, the Babylonian departure. Now, does anybody know who this man is? An artist's rendition of. Anybody know? This is a man by the name of Abraham. Now, do you think that the experience of Abraham has any correlation to this day and age? Yes. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews. You know, I remember when I was a young lad coming up in the church, we used to sing a song called Father Abraham Had Many Sons. Had, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. So Hebrews chapter 11, notice what the Bible says in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 8. Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 8. The Bible says, by presumption. Is that what it says? It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. It says the heirs with him of the same promise. Notice what it, what it goes on to say. It says, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is what? Whose builder and maker is is God. Now notice this. So this is a symbol of the Babylonian departure. Now does anybody know what this is? Anybody know what this is? This is a modern shot of Abraham's ancient city of dwelling, Ur of the Chaldees. And contrary to popular opinion, you see, and this is a point that we really love to emphasize. The Bible is literally the greatest historical document that has been given to the human race. And unfortunately, when we, when we look at the Bible, many times we just look at it as a book for just uh, bedtime stories. We really do not understand that this is the literal history of the human race. The literal history of the human race. Now notice this. This is taken from the Washington Post Royal Tombs of Ur, Elegance, and all of these things. Now, this was written in what year? 1999. Notice what this says. Ur, the very word means old in English as prefix. Ur denotes the primitive, the original, the earliest. Now, does the Bible talk about Ur of the Chaldees? Yes, it does. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis. We want to get some context. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis. Now remember, we're going over the experience of Abraham for a specific purpose. For a specific purpose. Now again, what is the title of this evening's message? The Babylonian Departure. The Babylonian Departure. 
All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to start in uh, Genesis chapter 11, actually. Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 27. Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 27. It says, now these things, it says, now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. It says, And Haran died before his father, Terah, in the land of his nativity, in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren, she had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, uh, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the what? Ur of the Chaldees. Now, unfortunately, for a very long period of time, persons did not believe that this Ur of the Chaldees was an actual historical place. But notice what this says. This says, in many an early uh, agricultural city-state, in Sumer in Iraq was the among the earliest art was used to terrify, and it's unfortunate. Many archaeologists complain that as a result of the war in, in Iraq and in Afghanistan that has actually destroyed many of the agricultural uh, and archaeological uh, artifacts in Iraq. It says, shapeshifters and dragons, withering altered snakes, swarm over the grave goods in the fabulous Chinese exhibition at the National Gallery of all right, now this is taken from Al Jazeera. This says, Pope to visit ancient city of Ur, the cradle of what? Now, does the Bible talk about a spiritual Babylon at the end of time? It talks about a spiritual Babylon at the end of time. Unfortunately, the civilization and culture that was inaugurated in Babylon, Satan has used this model all the way from that time to the present state. Does that make sense? And sadly, every corrupt form of government is merely a replica of this ancient civilization. All right, this says, in July 2016, UNESCO placed Ur on the World Heritage List in addition to the marshes of southern Iraq and other sites such as Eridu and al Raqqar. It says, during his visit to Iraq, Pope Francis will visit Ur after meetings with politicians, religious figures, and archaeological sites in these different cities. All right, we're going to skip past this point. All right, now this is taken from the Telegraph. Now, who here has heard of the Telegraph? All right, now this uh, particular outlet it comes from Great Britain. It says, unearthing the splendor of Ur in Iraq. So what we're going to do we're going to see what the culture of Ur of the Chaldees was like. Because remember, the title of this message is entitled what? The Babylonian Departure. And what we're going to find out is the very same principles and mechanisms that Abraham was having to deal with in Babylon, in Ur of the Chaldees, are the very same systems that we are dealing with in this day and age. All right, it says, Ur of the Chaldees, as, men as it is mentioned in the Bible, was one of the great urban centers of the Sumerian civilization of southern Iraq and remained an important city until its conquest by Alexander the Great. Now, was Alexander the Great an important figure or an unimportant figure? Very important. It says, it is thought to have reached its epigogy under King Ur, uh, Namu, an accomplished warrior and founder of Sumer's third dynasty. Again, we're going to skip past this. All right, now, does anybody know who this particular man is? Anybody know who this man is or was? A man by the name of Leonard Woolley. He was a British archaeologist who did a lot of excavations in ancient Ur of the Chaldees. Now, notice what this man said. He said the contents of the tombs illustrate a very highly developed state of society of an urban type. So again, 
contrary to the principles of Darwinian evolution, were the ancient civilizations of the past, were they very civilized? Were they very civilized, the ancient civilizations of the past? Yes, they were very civilized because Darwinian evolution tells us that we as human beings today have reached the apex of human development. But when you properly study history, you'll actually realize that man was actually much greater in the past than he is today. It says, a society in which the architect was familiar with all the basic principles of construction known to us today. Now again, the archeologists and the architects, are they still unable to actually explain how the Egyptians built the pyramids? Are they able to explain that to us? They literally have no idea how the Egyptians were able to build those monuments. It says the artist capable at times of the most vivid realism, we're gonna jump down, it says, the craftsman in metal possessed a knowledge of metallurgy and a technical skill which few ancient peoples ever rivaled. It says agriculture prospered and great wealth gave scope to luxury. So what it, was it a very sophisticated society? Yes, it was. Now we're getting to a point. Now, does anybody know what this is? Anybody know what this is? Because what must be understood is that connected with every civilization is religion. Connected with every civilization is religion. And unfortunately, this is a symbol of the religion that was being practiced in Ur of the Chaldees. Now, do you think that that is the same system of religion that is being practiced in the world today? Yes, it is. You know, because, you know, contrary to popular opinion, one of the, the most popular ideologies in Western civilization is something, again, called Darwinian evolution. And when we were just in Phoenix, as we were going through uh, the history of this, when you study the tenets of Darwinian evolution, it's nothing more than a modern reiteration of the philosophy of Plato. That's all it is. All right, now, does anybody know who this man was? A man by the name of Alfred Erdersheim, he was a Jewish convert to Christianity. Now, notice what this man said. This, now, again, this is highlighting the religion that was uh, present in Ur of the Chaldees. It says, thus Abram must in his youth have stood by the seashore and seen the sand innumerable, to which his posterity in after ages was likened. Another figure under which his posterity is described must have been equally familiar to his mind. It says, it is well known that the brilliancy of a starlight sky in the east, and especially where Abram dwelt, far exceeds anything which we witness in our latitudes. And this is why many of the heavenly bodies actually have Arabic names. This is the reason. It says, possibly this may have first led to those regions to the worship of the what? Now, does the Bible condemn the worship of the heavenly bodies? Now, again, these are ideologies that are very prevalent even in Christian circles. There are many Christians who, instead of consulting the Bible, we consult our zodiac signs. Now, is there any hope of salvation in the fact that you're a Pisces or the fact that you're a Sagittarius? Or the, or the fact that you are a cancer. No, it's not. It says, and Abram must have been the more attracted to their contemplation as the city in which uh, he dwelt was wholly given to what? Wholly given to idolatry. Now, is it possible to properly develop Christian character living in an environment wholly given to idolatry? Now, do you think that there's any correlation as to the reason why God told us to get out of the city and get into the country? Now, this is a question. Uh, what individual was the person responsible for, the, uh, for building cities in the world? Who is responsible for building the first city that ever existed in human experience? No, it was Cain. It was Cain. Actually, let's turn in our Bible to the book of Genesis. It was Cain. Now, don't get me wrong, Nimrod was an eventual successor of Cain, but it started with Cain. 
Notice what the Bible says. Notice what the Bible says. And we're going to start, we're going to start in uh, Genesis chapter 4 in verse 16. Genesis chapter 4 in verse 16. The Bible says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. It says, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch. Now, this is not to be confused with the righteous Enoch. This says, And bare Enoch, and he builded a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. So according to this historical uh, record, who was responsible for building the first city? Now again, was Cain righteous or was he wicked? Wicked. So in light of that, do you think that this city that he built was righteous or was it full of wickedness? It was full of wickedness. Now are the cities of today full of wickedness? Yes, they are. It says, for the real sight of Ur has been ascertained from the circumstance that the bricks uh, still found there bear the very name of Ur on them. Notice what he finishes by saying. Now, this word points to Her uh, Herky, the ancient moon god, and Ur of the Chaldees was the great moon city, the very center of the Chaldean moon worship. Now, does everybody remember the experience of Daniel and the three worthies when they went to Babylon? Now, the Bible talks about that they came in contact with the Chaldeans, and this religion that was being practiced in Ur of the Chaldees was incorporated into the Babylonian civilization. Does that make sense? All right. Now remember, we're getting to a point. We're getting to a point. All right. Now again, this is an artist's rendition of this is an artist's rendition of Abraham. Now this is an amazing point. This is an amazing point. And this is just some food for thought. Who here thinks that this is a real person? This picture is actually AI generated. It's just food for thought. Now this is taken from Patriarchs and Prophets. It says, Hebrews 11, now we read Hebrews 11, it says, Abraham's unquestioning obedience is one of the most striking evidences of faith to be found in all the Bible. Now what is this referring to? This act of faith. Now what did Abraham do that made God say that this was a great act of faith. What did Abraham do? Okay, so he left Ur of the Chaldees. Let's turn, uh, we're in Genesis, let's turn to chapter 12. Let's turn to chapter 12. Let's turn to chapter 12. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, Now the Lord hath said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's what? And from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be what? So God told Abraham to escape from Ur of the Chaldees. Now again, in light of what we just went through, why do you think God was telling Abram to get out of Ur of the Chaldees? So he was going to be corrupted by the prevailing idolatry. He was going to be corrupted. It says, to him faith was the substance of things hoped for. It says, relying upon the divine promise without the least outward assurance of its fulfillment. Now, do you think that we need to have this type of faith in this generation? You see, brothers and sisters, there's a statement in the book, Great Controversy. Now, who here has read and studied the book, Great Controversy? Now, in that book, it brings out the principle that in this generation that we are going to need an experience in which we do not now have. And it goes on to say that many of us are simply too lazy to get close to Jesus. Simply too lazy. It says, he abandoned home and kindred and native land and went forth, he knew not whither, to follow where God 
should leave. It says, the message of God came to Abram, get thee out of thy country. It says, uh, Abram must be separated from the associations of early life. Many times when God wants to do something amazing in our life, we have to be separated from those in whom we find kindred and comfort. Because many times those who are close to us can be the greatest hindrance for the fulfilling of God's purposes. Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, yes. Very good point. It says the influence of kindred and friends would interfere with the training which the Lord purposed to give his servant. It says his character must be peculiar, differing from what? Now, this is a question by a show of hands. Who is willing to be different for the sake of Jesus? You see, because unfortunately, we live in a day and age where, and, and this is not as a means of attack upon persons who are doing this, but sadly, very many of us who profess the name of Christ, we are so afraid of being different than the world. We're, we're terrified of it. We will literally do everything and anything to make sure we look just like the world. It says he could not even explain his course of action as to be understood by his friends. Spiritual things are spiritually what? The Bible says very clearly that the carnal mind, it is not subject to the law of God. And it says neither indeed can be. So when God is communicating to us that we need to do something, should we be consulting those who do not know God? No, we should not. And sometimes even those who know God may be misguided. All right, now, does anybody know who this man was? Anybody know who this man was? It's a man by the name of E.A. Sutherland. He was one of the greatest educational minds that was ever given to the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Notice what this man says. Now, this is so powerful. This is taken from a book that he wrote called Living Fountains or Broken Sisters. Who here has heard of that book? I would encourage every person to read that book, Living Fountains or Broken Cisterns, one of the greatest treaties I have ever read on the history of education. This says the slaying of infants and children is but carrying out in the extreme what is always done mentally and spiritually when children are taught false philosophy. This is what was taking place in Ur of the Chaldees. Now, we may not be sacrificing our children literally to Molech, but do you think we're literally sac sacrificing our children in this day and age? Now, do you think we're sacrificing our children by, give, give, by giving them Disney and Netflix, where, they're, where, where our children are being taught all of these ideologies that have no root or foundation in the word of God? It says that man might not bring upon himself immediate destruction the language was confused. This is talking about Babel. It says it was from this influence as found in the city of Ur of the Chaldees that Abram was called, Abraham was called. Although the family of Ur of Terah knew the true God in his worship, it was impossible for him to counteract the influence of the what? Of the city. Of the city. It says with its idolatrous practices, so God called Abraham into the what? Again, do you think we need to get into the country? Yes, we do. This says, these 50 years with God and angels as teachers revealed to us as no other period does the results of true education and merit careful attention. I mean, just imagine, Abraham literally had angels and Christ come down in a human form to literally instruct him. Now, by the grace of God, we can still have the angels and the Holy Spirit ministering to us, but to actually have actual angels manifest in human form and come down and teach you the way of righteousness. I mean, it is just amazing the privileges that these men and women have. It says, if the workings of the Spirit ever wrought changes in the human heart, those changes came to Abraham. It is not strange that when God called the first time, the voice seemed far away and but partially awoke the slumbering soul. We're going to jump down. 
It says, it has been stated before that God teaches by the annunciation of principles or universal laws. Does everybody get that point? Everybody get that point? This is saying that God teaches, again, by enunciation, so God tends to repeat himself again and again and again and again and again. Of principles or universal laws, and the spirit which comes by faith enlightens the senses that they may grasp the illustrations of these laws in the physical world. It says, this is heaven's method of teaching the, angel the angelic throng, and it was the method applied before the fall. It says, here was a pupil lacking faith. How should he be taught the wisdom of the eternal follow? As Christ lived his visible life, because the eye of faith was blind in Israel, so in the time of Abraham, God taught inductively. Notice what uh, Sutherland goes on to say. To him who had no faith, God came visibly at first and leading step by step, developed a faith which before his death enabled Abraham to grasp eternal principles of truth if God but spoke. What this is saying is that God is trying to get us to the point where we do not have to rely upon visual manifestations in order to follow and to believe the word of God. Does that make sense? Inductively, uh, just to give an illustration, let's turn in our Bibles. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 2 Peter. The Bible is going to give an illustration, an illustration of this point that E.A. Sutherland is bringing out. 2 Peter, let's turn to 2 Peter. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read in verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 16. Notice what the Bible says. It says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power of and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his want. Now, when this says eyewitnesses of his majesty, what is the apostle Peter specifically referring to? Yes, the Mount of Transfiguration. Yes, in Matthew chapter 17. It says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well what? In whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light shining in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your what? So what the Bible is saying, highlighting this point that E.A. Sutherland is bringing out, is that even though the apostles visibly saw Jesus Christ glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration, the sure words of the Bible are more sure than what they saw with their visible eyes. Does that make sense? So especially in this generation, when the Bible says there's going to be a myriad of deceptions, our faith has to be in the word. We can't go off of our feelings, our past experience. It has to be in the word, in the word. And that's what Abraham was able to come to understand. All right, now we're, now we're going to really bring the application of this point. Now, we have been talking about this Babylonian exodus, this Babylonian departure that Abraham had. Now, do you think that you and I need to do some Babylonian exodus ourselves? Because as we're going to find out that sadly, we are currently living in spiritual Babylon. We're living in spiritual Babylon. Now, does anybody know what this is? Anybody know what this is? What is this trying to depict? What is this trying to depict? Yes, this is talking about the mechanics of the mind. Now, is the mind a highly sophisticated uh, mechanism? A very highly sophisticated mechanism. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 12. 
Now remember, we're talking about modern Babylon. We're going to see how some of the same things that Abraham had to deal with in Ur of the Chaldees, we have to deal with in this time of the world's history. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living what? Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your what? So God is saying is that our minds have to be what? They have to be renewed. They have to be renewed. Notice this. All right, now again, this is E.A. Sutherland and his first wife. Unfortunately, she died because of very extenuating circumstances. But again, notice what this says. Education, pure and simple, in breadth of its meaning, is what? Character development. Everything that we ingest into our minds, every activity in which we engage in on a day-to-day -day basis is fashioning our education. And education is nothing more than character development. Now, our character is actually going to determine where we spend eternity. So in light of that, do you think that we have to take very strenuous steps to ensure that what we're ingesting into our minds is going to help us make it to heaven? Yes. Notice this. Now, does anybody know what this is? Now, this is a symbol of a movie called Bros. This was actually a homosexual movie that came out last year. And in this particular movie, it was literally glorifying the homosexual lifestyle so much to the point that X-rated scenes between men were taking place in this movie. And this came out as a theatrical performance. Now, do you think that this is fashioning the minds of very many persons in this day and age? Now, again, this is not just in the world, but are these ideologies in the church? Is this even in the Seventh-day Adventist church? Unfortunately, because we are afraid to stand for the faith that was once delivered to the saints, we are afraid to call sin by its right name. Now, are those who are being dominated by Satan in the homosexual lifestyle, do they need our sympathy and empathy? Is God more than willing to deliver them from the bondages of Satan? But how are we going to help them if we're telling them that this lifestyle is normal? Because it's just not uh, homosexuality, it's adultery normal. Is fornication normal? Is lying normal? Is drinking alcohol normal? None of these things are normal, but unfortunately, they're making their way into the presence of believers. Now, does anybody know what this is? Now, this is a symbol of a movie, a two-part movie that has come out over the past couple of years, glorifying some of the same ancient idolatries that were in Ur of the Chaldees. Notice this. A movie called Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, and unfortunately, with many of us as black persons, we were seeing this as a badge of distinction that this was helping to give us identity. Now, notice this. This says Wakanda Forever exploits commercial politics. We're going to jump past this. Very powerful point. We're going to jump past this. This says Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, teases the smallest slither of a lesbian what? So this is saying that in this movie, and I want to make this very clear, the vast majority of young persons, doesn't matter who they are, are watching these types of movies. Now, we want to understand what is being inculcated in these movies. Now, this is Black Panther, uh, Panther Wakanda Forever, is rich in what? In mythology. Now, we're going to find out that this mythology is not necessarily just mythology, but it is literally a system of religion. Notice this. This says the core pantheon of Wakanda is known as the Orisha, which refers in real life to spirits. Now, when this says spirits, do you think that this is referring to angels or demons? Demons. Notice this. This says spirits that play a key role in the Yoruba religion of West Africa and several diasporic religions. Notice this. The Orisha is comprised of five gods based on ancient Egyptian and other African deities. Now, what was the religion of ancient Egypt? 
Now, were they serving the true and living God in ancient Egypt? Notice this. Now, does anybody know who this man was? It's a man by the name of George Rawlinson. He was a professor of ancient history at Oxford University. Notice what he says about the religion of Egypt. Another peculiar feature of the Egyptian religion, and one in which, though it may have had some redeeming points, must be pronounced on the whole low and degrading, was the worship of what? Now, was this the same religion that ancient Israel fell back into after they crossed the Red Sea? Yes, it was. Now, what particular animal were they worshiping? A calf, yes. And today, we still have many people around the world who, ro who worship the calf. Hindus are an example. It says, sheep, especially rams, were generally regarded as sacred, being emblems of Neph. Neph represented the creative mind. All right, we're going to run past these things. This is a man by the name of Manly Palmer Hall. He was an esoteric writer and a 33rd degree Freemason. Has anybody ever heard of Freemasonry? Now, especially here in the South, Freemasonry is very popular. And there's even uh, some of us as Seventh-day Adventists, as Christians, who are a part of these devilish organizations. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God does not want us to be a part of these institutions. This says when the, now he's talking about the religion of ancient Egypt. Notice, when the venerable equinox no longer occurred in the sign of Taurus, the sun god incarnated in the constellation of what? So when we're looking at all of our zodiac signs, the only thing that we are doing is practicing ancient sun worship. It says, and the ram then became a vehicle of solar power. The goat is both a phallic symbol. Now, when this says phallic symbol, what is this referring to? Not to, not to be degrading. This is talking about the male genitalia. This says, when used in black magic, the pentagram is called the sign of the cloven foot or the goat of Mendes. Anybody heard of the goat of Mendes? Yes. This is very popular in pop culture. Many of our young people, our grandchildren, are wearing these iconographies on their t-shirts, not realizing that they're being initiated into these religions. All right, now, does anybody know what this is? Now, remember, we're talking about the Babylonian environment in which we are currently surrounded. Now, this is a symbol of witchcraft. Now, is witchcraft popular in American society? Yes, it is. And there's very even many of us as Christians who are secretly practicing witch, witchcraft and we're actually casting spells on some of our church members. Do you know that that is literally happening in Christian churches in America? Literally. This says why paganism and witchcraft are making a comeback. Now, brothers and sisters, it, it, this needs to be emphasized. Is this serious? This is very serious. We're told in the spirit of prophecy that as we see these things taking place, that this should literally cause us to be agitated. We should not just be comfortable seeing all of this wickedness and just be complacent coming to church on Sabbath, thinking that this has no correlation to us. Because there are very many of our neighbors, even surrounding here, who I can promise you are practicing this witchcraft. We're going to skip past this. This is taken from the Telegraph. Fear Satanists have returned to New Forest Village after a lamb found with slit throat. We're not going to read this for the sake of time. This says, now this is amazing how superstition and clairvoyance influenced fashion designers from Christian Dior and Coco Chanel. It was even that uh, during a, uh, a fashion uh, show, I think it was in Paris back in 2016, one of these very prominent fashion houses, uh, they literally hired a shaman in order to do rain dances to ensure that it wouldn't rain during the fashion show. L this is literally taking place. All right, we're going to skip past this. We're getting to a point now. Does anybody know what this is? This is one of, one of the great forms of ancient paganism that we are practicing today. Unfortunately, instead of, and again, very many of us as Christians, we're coming to church, we're saying that we love God, but our uh, gods are not really Jesus, 
and, and, and all of the things that we understand, but it's really persons like this, like Justin Jefferson and LeBron James and Tom Brady and all of these individuals. These are the gods in whom we are worshiping. Anybody know what this is? And these particular sports players are actually even more popular than American sports players. You know, it, it's, it's literally insane. Does anybody know who this man is? A man by the name of Messi. Does anybody know what country he plays for? Argentina, they actually just won the World Cup and it's, and it's amazing. I was literally looking at a clip where a fan rushed onto the pitch, got in front of Messi and literally bowed down before him and literally started worshiping the man. These forms of idolatry are literally so encapsulizing our mind that we don't even understand what we're doing. And again, when these things are spoken, some person may say, well, Brother Sam, you're, you're taking these things to extremes. How in the world can you say that this is a form of idolatry? Notice this. Anybody know what this is? Again, this is the symbol of so many of the gods in whom we worship. We're getting to a point. Satan has devised a multitude of ways in which to keep men from serving who? God. He has invented sports and what? Now, what is the most popular uh, sports entertainment in the United States? Football. Now, is football a, 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 a soft sport or is it a violent sport? You know, I, I was watching an interview of an ex-NFL uh, player, and he was saying that football is a wickedly violent sport. And, you know, it's so sad. There are so many ex-NFL players who are literally beating and killing their wives and girlfriends because of the CTE that they are dealing with. And there are so many people that are complaining that they're taking the, the violence out of football because we as an American population, we love our violence. And so in light of that, we go to church on Sunday and then we get our heavy dose of violence on the television screen. It says that horse races and football matches, which are attended by thousands and thousands of people, lives for which Christ shed his blood are thrown away. And just think about this. There are even so many football players. There's a man by the name of Herschel Walker. Anybody know who that man is? This man is considered one of the greatest running backs that has ever played. And if you were to see this man today, he can barely walk. The man's body has been so battered and bruised and when he was asked, would he do it again? He said, I would literally go back and do it again if I had the opportunity. To think that you would literally be willing to sacrifice your heart, mind, and soul for a game. This is insanity. But again, because of our lack of spiritual discernment, we don't understand the reality of what we're actually practicing. This says, what will become of the souls of men and boys whose lives are thus extinguished? Will they be counted worthy of the redemption which Christ died to secure for them? Now, this is amazing. This is taken from a book called The Sun and Myth and Art. It talks about all of these things have their origins in the pagan fertility rites. This is why so many sports uh, stars are literally rampant with fornication. Now, does anybody know what this is? Now, this is, again, one of the gods in which we worship. Because for many of us, instead of interpreting current events in light of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, we interpret current events in light of CNN and Fox News. And so what Anderson Cooper, what Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity tells us, this is what we receive as the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice this. Now, does anybody know who this man was? A man by the name of Malcolm X. Notice what this individual said. Now, this is amazing. Does anybody know that this man was actually raised as a Seventh-day Adventist? Sometimes I think about it. Imagine if this man had the potency of the Seventh-day Adventist message. Lord have mercy. This says the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent, and that's what? because they control the minds of the what? They control the minds of the masses. Now, this is just to give an example. Again, brothers and sisters, we're emphasizing a point. Now, does everybody remember 
Now, who were we told by the modern mainstream media was the, was the enemy and the boogeyman that we needed to fear? Islam. So now Islam is the boogeyman in which we need to fear, and every Muslim we need to hate with a, a genuine vehemence. Is this what the television told us? Yes it, yes, it is. And unfortunately, very many times when we were going into the uh, airport and we might have seen somebody with a hijab, we got a little fear in our heart because we might, we might have thought that they were going to blow up the plane. Now, but the reality is, is the average Muslim blowing up planes? Now, what was the reason why we were told to hate that population? Why were we told to hate that population? Justify war? Now, now, what things are located in these Arab, uh, Arabic countries? Natural resources. This is a system of principle that has existed for millenniums. All right, now, does anybody know what this is? Now, again, we're talking about this system of Babylon. We're bringing this message to a close. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. Now, is everybody following this? I know we're going over a lot of information. Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, notice what the Bible says. So we see it from a, a, a necessarily a worldly standpoint, but we're going to see its religious connotation. Revelation chapter 14, and we're going to start in verse 8. Now in context, this is a trivia question, now in context, when was the first angel's message proclaimed historically? Okay, only one person. Anybody else have any uh, uh, suggestions? When was the first angel's message preached historically? All right, so yes, that is very true. Uh, roughly around between 1833 uh, and 1844. All right, now we're going to sk uh, skip down to the second angel's message. In verse 8, it says, And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen is what? is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her what? Now, when this says Babylon, who is this referring to? What body of religious persuasion is this referring to? Okay, somebody says apostate Protestantism. How do you know that this is referring to apostate Protestantism? Let's turn in our Bibles to, the, to uh, Revelation 17. Just a few chapters over, Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, we're going to read in verse 5. Revelation chapter 17, we're going to read in verse 5 as we bring this message to a close. It says, and upon her forehead was a name written. This is talking about this Babylon. Mystery uh, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the what? So one of the characteristics of Babylon is that she is the mother of what? Harlots. Now, is a harlot a pure woman or an impure woman? Impure woman. So if Babylon is the mother of harlots, if she is a mother, that must mean that she has what? Daughters or children. Does that make sense? So let's turn in our Bibles back to Revelation 14. Revelation 14. Revelation 14. And we're going to read in verse 8 again. It says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now, so again, in context, when was the first angel's message preached historically? We're putting a point. Okay, around 1833, all, all the way up until about 1844. So historically, when was the second angel's message preached? Okay, so around this time of 1844. Everybody get the historical context? Notice, it says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now, when we think of Babylon, who do we initially think of? Rome, the papacy. But in context, can this actually be talking about the papacy? Why? Why not? Not, not who's being preached to? Okay. There's a specific answer. Did the papacy just start falling around the time of 1844? No, the papacy has been falling for centuries upon centuries. So by default, this cannot be referring to the papacy. Does that make sense? So what this must be referring to is those religious bodies 
that are holding on to the doctrines or principles of the papacy. Does that make sense? All right. Now, does anybody know what this is? Now, this was about uh, seven some odd years ago. This was an event called Together, One Moment Can Define a Generation. Unfortunately, the historical legacy that was left by our Protestant forefathers like Martin Luther and John Calvin and Theodore Beza and William Tyndale and John Wycliffe and all these men, sadly, Protestantism has greatly degenerated and the Protestantism of today is not the Protestantism of the past. And as a result of this, there has been a great desire to merge regular Protestant Christians with the tenets of Roman Catholicism. Notice this. Notice this. This says, together is a modern-day evangelical revival complete with TED Talks, hip-hop, and no politics. Now, this was the man that was uh, doing this movement. We're getting to a point. Now, this is, these are the words of the man himself. Everything now is protest. I am against this I or I hate that. We really believe there is a longing to come together. Now, do we need to come together as believers in Christ? Do we need the unity to which Christ prayed for? But is it talking about this type of unity? No, it's not. It says, we, now notice what the man says. We don't have to agree on everything, but we can come together around the hope of Jesus. Now, is this a true biblical statement? No, it's not. Now, this is insane. This says, together 16 will be a day when we will lay down what divides us, politics, race, social issues, and theological differences, so doctrine is not important. To come together and lift up Jesus who unites us. Notice this. During this political year, we see so many people of faith becoming negative and critical, jaded. Where is our help found? Where is our hope found? Not in political leaders. What better time to do something on a large scale? Okay, we're going to jump down to a point. Now, does anybody know who this man is? Pope Francis. One of the great backers of this together movement was a man by the name of Pope Francis. Now, to the general public, is Pope Francis seen as a good man or a bad man? Unfortunately, the Vatican, the papacy, has a great public relations team. A great public relations team. Now, does anybody actually know what is the name of this man? Yes, Jorge Bergoglio. Now, does anybody know what country uh, does he hail from? Argentina. Does anybody know what was his position in Argentina? This man was the leading Jesuit in Argentina, and he was actually responsible uh, for taking place in something called Argentina's Dirty War. This man was actually a war criminal who was actually going to be brought before the courts, but when he became a uh, pope, they actually acquitted him of all the charges. Notice this. Notice this. Some argued against a more prominent role for Pope Francis, that's good, and Hall acknowledged that efforts to attract participants from all of Christianity weren't entirely successful. Notice what the man says. There is, the reality is, there is a lot of division, a lot of deep-seated generational things. It's just a generational thing. We're calling for a family gathering, and our family is a what? Big one. Notice this. Notice how the man refers to Pope Francis. Every family has an awkward uncle you're not super psyched to hang out with. Yes, the awkward uncle that is touching all of the little children. For those coming, there will be a lot of awkward uncles coming too. Now, do you think that we need to have a barbecue with this awkward uncle? No, we don't. We're coming to a point. As we approach the last crisis, it is a vital moment that harmony and unity exist amongst the Lord's instrumentalities. The world is filled with storm and war and variance, yet under one head, the papal power the people will unite to oppose God in the person of his witnesses. So again, it doesn't matter whether a person considers themselves atheist, pan-African, uh, Buddhist, Hindu. It does not matter what your ideology is. If you are not following the principles contained in the word of God, you will eventually follow the Pope of Rome. 
We're coming to a point now. This is our very last slide. Does anybody know what this is a symbol of? Anybody know what this is a symbol of? This is a symbol of the United States Capitol. This is a symbol of the fact that the United States is literally about to come to an end. Unfortunately, very many of us believe that the United States is going to last forever. Is this nation going to last forever? No, it is not. God is about to usher in a new heavenly kingdom, and he wants each and every one of us to be a part of that kingdom. Notice what the prophet says. The scriptures point forward to, the, to a time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon, as made by the second angel of Revelation, we just read that, is to be repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the various organizations that constitute Babylon. Since that message was first given in the summer of 1844, with every rejection of truth, the minds of the people will become darker, their hearts more stubborn, until they are entrenched in an infidel hardihood. It says, in defiance of the warnings which God has given, they will continue to trample upon one of the precepts of the Decalogue. As the teachings of spiritualism are accepted by the churches, the restraint imposed by the carnal heart will be removed. A belief in spiritual manifestations opens the door to seducing spirits and doctrines of what? Of devils. And thus the influence of evil angels will be felt in the churches. Now in light of that, let's turn in our Bibles. We're already in Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation 18 and we're going to close on this point. Revelation chapter 18. Now notice what God says in regards to this Babylonian environment in which we live. Because again, it's not enough for us just to know that the seventh day is the Sabbath. In order for us to be truly extinguished from Babylon, we have to allow God to extinguish Babylon out of our hearts. It's not enough just to change location. Our minds have to be renewed by divine grace. Revelation 18, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his what? With his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, Satan's people. My people. Now, who is speaking in this verse? God. That ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her what? So the message that God is bringing home to each and every one of our hearts is that we have to come out of Babylon, brothers and sisters. Time is literally about to come to an end. And whatever we do, we must do quickly. Because again, it's not just about coming out of Babylon. There is a work that we have been called to do as Seventh-day Adventists. And as long as we wallow in the valley of decision, of indecision, that work is going to remain undone. How many of our neighbors are going down to Christless graves simply because we do not minister to them? Brothers and sisters, God is calling us to make a decision. And in light of that, just by show of hands, who here wants to say that I want to come out of Babylon, both physically and spiritually? Amen. And in light of that, let us kneel for a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, much truth was communicated. Lord, you have spoken to each and every one of our hearts. Lord, we, we sincerely pray that you would forgive us for allowing ourselves to, to, to wallow in this environment. And sometimes we even try to comfort ourselves that because we're not doing overt wickedness, that somehow we are okay. But one of Satan's greatest deceptions is to make us believe that our condition is much better than what it really is. Peter came to that crisis of his life and he genuinely believed 
that he was ready to die for his Lord and Savior. But sadly, when he was pressed with temptation, he proved himself a coward. Lord, I pray that you would help us. Help us to search our own hearts. As we go through this week, as we learn these things, I pray, dear Lord, that this week will be transformative for each and every one of us. I pray that you be with our families. I pray that you be with us individually. I know that upon our hearts there are things that are pressing our souls. Maybe we have children or grandchildren that are not in the ark of safety that we are pleading and praying for. Dear Lord, I pray that your spirit may touch them. Father, I pray in a, ve a very special way that you would help us to come to realize that we can lay our burdens and perplexities at your feet and leave them there. But you, you emphasize that we cannot have this blessed peace and rest while we are still hanging on to the tenets and the mindset of the world. So we just pray that you would please keep us to this end. Be with us as we go through the remainder of this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.